And there are numerous such examples. In, hu in humans, IOUs and money serve to facilitate this kind of delayed uh, reciprocation. I, as far as I know, no other species of animal has money, but uh, e equivalent arrangements work through individual recognition or some such device. Vampire bats learn which individuals of their social group can reliably be, uh, be, be um, can, can be relied upon to regurgitate blood. Um, and this whole bargaining of, of in, in regurgitated blood works because individuals remember who pays back and who doesn't. So kinship and reciprocation are two ways in which altruism comes about. There are a couple more which kind of follow on. Um, a reputation for being a good recipro reciprocator is important. And, and individuals will notice not only who pays them back as individuals, but who can be seen to be a, a reliable person who buys their round of drinks at the pub, etc. Reputation for generosity, reputation for not cheating uh, is something that people acquire. And then fourthly, the, perhaps uh, the, the most surprising of these ideas of why animals appear to behave altruistically is the Israeli zoologist Amots Zahavi's theory of the handicap principle. Zahavi studies babblers, which are little brown birds, Arabian babblers. And what he claims, with some evidence, is that dominant birds are most likely to give to subdominant birds. Dominant birds are most likely to uh, act as sentinels, warning the rest of the babbler group of the approach of predators, which seems on the face of it the wrong way around. You'd think that subordinate birds would be bullied into, say, giving up food or playing the dangerous role of sentinel. So Harvey's handicap interpretation is that what these dominant animals are in effect saying is, look how superior I am. I can afford to give you food. I can afford to give you, to donate some altruism towards you. I can afford to put myself in the vulnerable position of uh, being acting a sentinel against, against hawks. So we have four Darwinian accounts of where altruism comes from. Kinship, reciprocation, reputation, and the handicap principle. Not all animals do all these things. It depends upon the ecological details of the species. And our ancestors almost certainly lived under ideal conditions for all four of these um, precursors to altruism. We probably lived in groups, smallish groups, a bit like baboons perhaps, wandering over the savanna later on in villages. These are perfect conditions for kinship because anybody that you meet in your group is likely to be a, a relative. Secondly, anybody you meet is likely to be somebody that you're going to meet again and again and again throughout your life. That in turn fosters the conditions for reciprocation and for probably the handicap principle as well. So we can provide a good account of why our prehistoric ancestors in the Pleistocene of Africa might have been equipped in their brains with a rule of thumb which said, be good to everyone you meet, because everyone you meet would either be kin and or would be a potential reciprocator, etc. Now, that's fine, and that accounts for um, why our brains should be predisposed to be altruistic. It's less easy to see why we are still so altruistic, because we no longer go around in baboon-like bands. We no longer live in small villages. We live in large cities. We, the people that we deal with are very unlikely to be our kin. And there we constantly, every day of our lives, meet people that we're never going to meet again, not in a position to reciprocate. We give money to charity. We send clothes to tsunami victims. We donate uh, money to animal charities. We feel what I described before, the wrenching pity for somebody in distress, a dog in distress. Um, we have empathy, we have sympathy, we have all these qualities which don't seem to belong in, our, in the world of the selfish gene. And that's what I've got to try to account for. We can account for it if it was selective, 
towards members of our own narrow group, but how do we account for it when it's towards anybody? Well, it's important not to misstate the reach of natural selection. Selection does not, could not, favor the evolution of a cognitive awareness of what is good for our selfish genes. That cognitive awareness had to wait for the 20th century and even then was only understood by uh, a minority of scientifically trained people. What natural selection favors is not that which is best for the selfish genes. What it favors is rules of thumb in the brain which under ancestral conditions would have favored the survival of selfish genes. In a bird's brain, the rule of thumb, look after small squawking things in your nest and drop food into their red gapes, typically in nature has the effect of preserving the genes for doing that because small squawking, gaping things in your nest statistically are likely to be your own children. But the rule, of course, misfires if another baby bird somehow gets into the nest, a circumstance which is positively engineered by cuckoos. So could it be that our Good Samaritan urges are misfirings analogous to the misfiring of a uh, reed warbler when it drops food into the mouth of a baby cuckoo? This mistake or byproduct idea which I'm espousing would, would then work like this. Natural selection in ancestral times, when we lived in baboon-like bands, programmed into our brains the altruistic urges, which were non-discriminating. They, they applied to, they potentially applied to everybody. Nowadays, they no longer do, but it's actually no more surprising than the fact that we still have sexual lust, even though we may be using contraception and therefore know perfectly well that our urge to copulate does not lead to procreation. We know perfectly well that, uh, if, if, um, that, that, that the, the ultimate product of our sexual desire is, from a Darwinian point of view, useless. Uh, but, but that doesn't in any way diminish our sexual lust. Sexual lust is a strong urge which exists independently of its ultimate rationale. And what I want to suggest is that the same is true of our urge to kindness, altruism, generosity, empathy, pity, sympathy. Because in ancestral times, we only had the opportunity to show those, uh, those emotions towards objects which, from a selfish gene point of view, would have benefited our selfish genes. We can no more help ourselves really feeling pity, really feeling sympathy for a weeping unfortunate who's unrelated and unable to reciprocate, we can no more stop ourselves feeling a deep upwelling of sympathy and, and pity than we can help ourselves feeling lust for a member of the opposite sex who we know perfectly well cannot reproduce or is that infertile or is on, on the pill or something of that sort. Both are misfirings, both are mistakes Darwinian mistakes, blessed, precious mistakes. Um, and, I, and I want to stress that, that I'm not in any way demeaning, this Darwinian analysis is not in any way intended to demean the noble emotions of compassion and generosity, nor indeed of, of sexual desire. Um, channeled through the conduits of linguistic culture, Sexual desire emerges in the love poems of John Donne or Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Similarly, um, the, the lust to be generous, the lust to forgive, shows itself in Portia's great speech in The Merchant of Venice. And I suppose similarly, primitive brain rules of, rules of thumb of us versus them vendetta, which are also, it's easy to give a Darwinian analysis of them, manifest themselves in the running battles between um, Montagues and Capulets and um, the brain rules, the, the rules of thumb of 
empathy and altruism end up in the, the misfiring, again, that cheers us in the final reconciliation scene of Romeo and Juliet.